Hi there, Simon from SimonWoods.com. I am doing a tasting this evening for a group of people, and uh, they are a select gathering. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them are, maybe 40 or so, uh, but um, I've, got, I've got eight wines, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to taste them and work out what order to put them in, and I thought I might as well do them in front of the camera. The idea is I've got four whites, four reds, and there's something slightly unusual about them. I think most of it is to do with grape variety, but uh, um, I've got two from uh, St. Sainsbury's, two from Tesco, four from my local uh, independent wine merchant, which has just reopened after having a very stinky cellar. So hello to Julian and uh, all the team at Sunworth Wine Vault. Um, let's see how your wines match up to the supermarkets. First one I've got is a supermarket one, and it's Tesco's Picpoul de Pinay, uh, and 2010 vintage. Let's give it a whirl. Now, I've changed my mind about Pickpool a few times in the last uh, uh, last year or so, um, largely because I used to think of it as being like the Muscadet of the South, um, some, something that's sort of crisp, slightly briny, very seafood friendly. And then, I don't know whether it was a vintage thing, some of the wines that I came across started being a bit plumper and a bit fatter and uh, maybe not quite as seafood friendly as they have been in the past. But I stick my nose in here and it's back to business as usual. It smells light, it smells fresh and clean, it smells like it's going to have a slightly bracing, marine edge and um, smells like it's going to be quite tasty. That's just what it is. It doesn't have um, some of that butter clenching acidity that you get further north in Muscadet. You can tell it's, it's uh, f the fruit's properly ripened but there is still this uh, this edge in there, that, that little bit of acidity, uh, that bit, bit of freshness and so whereas yes there is a tender peachy edge, there's also this quite uh, uh, firmer apple and citrus edge, and uh, I like it, I like it, I could probably drink rather a lot of that with rather a lot of seafood. On the marine theme, we are now in Spain, in Galicia to be pre precise, so which is the bit above Portugal, the top, top left if you don't know your Spanish geography, and uh, we're in a grape here called Godeo, and uh, Godeo uh, is um, perhaps best known for its performance in a place called Val de Oras. Well this is from a place next door called Monterey, so let's see how we get on with Crego e Monaguillo 2011. Now it's 2011 vintage and we're in uh, just March 2012 here, so it's still pretty young wine and I stick my nose in there and I'm getting some of that bubble gummy edge of uh, just the ends of a coolish fermentation coming through. But the fruit is now starting to come out of its shell and, and it, it's really nice fruit. I find Godeo a very attractive grape. Um, and uh, what it's got about it, um, it's got a, a little bit of that... Um, I suppose, it, well, chili moya, uh, custard apple edge, uh, but mixed with, so there always seems to be something of the soil, it always seems to uh, pick up a little bit of, uh, uh, sometimes the soil's a bit slaty, sometimes there's uh, um, uh, other things in there, but it, yeah, it, 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 the, there's the fruit, and there's this quite weighty bit, custard apple, the custardy bit, uh, but then there's the, uh, the the terroir edge, and I get that here, and I think that um, it's looking good now, but well, it's smelling good now, uh, and I think come three months time it'll be looking even better. Interesting, that. What I like about it is it start, you, you put it in your mouth and you think, oh, God, this is going to be quite a fat monster. And it's got this peachy, rounded, if you've ever had the custard apple, it is this rounded, uh, rich, slight, ever so slightly creamy fruit flavour. Uh, but then the freshness kicks in. And there's a bit of freshness because we're close to the Atlantic here. So there's a bit of Atlantic freshness in there. But there's also this fresh terroir backbone giving it, um, yeah, firming it up cleaning up the finish, making you want to have another sip of it and some more seafood. But I was trying to sip about seafood on the first one as well. The first one is probably one of those which is like, almost like a squeeze of lemon on, on your oysters or on, uh, on mussels or something like that. Here it could, it's a bit richer and rounder, could cope with uh, some fleshier things. So if you're, you're, if you're, you're more on the prawny lobster end there. Uh, but both tasty and uh, rather nice. Uh, wine number three, um, Weissburgunder, uh, but uh, not Weissburgunder from Germany or from Austria, but um, we're in Italy here. Uh, we're in the Alto Adige, so it's the bit that's just below Austria. Uh, so it's the Ernst and Neue uh, 2010 Weissburgunder, which is the same as Pinot Blanc if you don't know your uh, German translations, or if you do know your German translations, it's still Pinot Blanc. And it's strange when you, there, there is 
far more of what I get from flavouring Austrian wines here than I get in, in uh, uh, Italian wines from further south. Uh, so there is this bracing, um, almost a slightly peppery, um, yes, yeah, spicy edge to, to, uh, to, to the smell. The citrus, uh, and it's on the ripe citrus, very ripe lemons, ripe limes, uh, but it feels like it's got a, a, slight, a slightly Teutonic edge. It feels like it's going to be quite firm, uh, quite upright, and uh, but maybe it's got a fleshy, naughty core. Let's just have a see and find out. That's tasty as well. Uh, and again, uh, I keep talking about this fat flesh, a thin spine, and uh, not that this is a fat wine, the, 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 there is a, 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 maybe a soft uh, creamy edge to it, and um, some, some ripe pear, and uh, some of this ripe citrus fruit, but it's more that, uh, that citrus acidity and that mineral character that's, uh, that's forming the backbone of the wine, and everything else is wrapped around it uh, in beautiful measure. Um, I, this is the sort of wine that is not spilling over the top of its jeans like I am. Uh, but uh, uh, it keeps you satisfied. It, it, it's one of those that's got weight to it, but it leaves your mouth refreshed. Again, on the seafood spectrum, if you're wondering about what to have with it, but uh, have it with pleasure, with friends. Uh, let's see whether we can say the same about the final wine. Actually, I think all of these uh, are um, unoaked, which is... Um, I, I, I wonder why people sort of bother with oak sometimes. There's, there's some wines where, uh, where the fruit is so lovely in the first place. You think, why bother and uh, uh, why, why muddy it with anything else? Anyway, wine number four, last of the whites, uh, Tabilk, 2008 Marsan, uh, from the Nagambi Lake uh, district of Victoria. Now, Marsan hails from the northern Rhone Valley in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in France, where it's the, one of the main ingredients. It, it, it does a partnership with another grape called Roussan for wines like White Hermitage, White Saint Joseph, White Crow's Hermitage. Um, and um, has started to travel a bit more widely in the last few years. But in this part of Victoria, uh, they've been growing it for decades. And uh, these guys, and another company called Mitchelton, they've both uh, shown that unoaked Marsan. Uh, looks good as a young wine and uh, looks even better as an older wine. As we think, you, you taste them when they're uh, 10, 15 years old and they've gone into this lovely honeyed, honeysuckle, rounded, soft peachiness with a toasty edge. Um, if you know uh, Hunter Semillon, it's almost like a slightly more exotic uh, version of Hunter Semillon, uh, again, which is an unoaked wine, and uh, relying on it, so it's got this, it's got this, um, yeah, this citrusy core, uh, but then these honeyed, toasty flavours, which you'd swear it had been in an oak barrel, but they say, nope, nope, no oak here. Here, it's like a wine in transit. So it's uh, four years old, and so it's maybe losing a little bit of its freshness, but it's still got a limey zip. But now you're getting some of these honey toasty characters coming through. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, a, a wine that, like this, uh, people say, how, how long would you keep it? And it's the sort of wine that you can easily forget and uh, uh, come back to 10 years later, and it'll be still um, fighting fit, going strong. And um, it's uh, for, for not many wines you can say that about, uh, especially at 10 quid. But uh, anyway, let's taste it. Well, I've said it for the previous three wines, uh, so I'm going to say it here. Richness, backbone. It's got it. it it's that, that. That's what it's got. Um. It, so it's got this rich and uh, yeah, that honeyed core and uh, the the edge of lemon, the edge of lime, uh, maybe a bit of the toastiness coming through. This is uh, this is probably the highest alcohol, thirteen and a half percent. But um, you don't notice it. Uh, you notice that maybe maybe an ample roundness, but it's kept in check uh, by this acidity, by this freshness and uh, that, that that citrus edge. And uh, uh, delicious now. Uh, got a feeling that uh, well, what time are we now? We're we're, we're coming up to five o'clock, and uh, so we, we, we're going to be uh, tasting this in about two two and a half three hours. And uh, I think I think it's going to uh, look even better than it does now. Um, I like these four wines, and I'm sure the good folk of uh, Greenfield, which is where I am tonight, will enjoy them too. So I'm going to say goodbye for the moment, and um, uh, maybe go and uh, powder my nose and come back for them reds. But for the moment, see you soon.